Let us welcome our wonderful expert today, Professor William Taubman, the Bertrand Snell Professor of Political Science Emeritus at Amherst College. He is the author of Gorbachev and His Life and Times, which is amazing. And as we mentioned, he'll be able to sign copies for you later. Um, he's also the biographer of Khrushchev, The Man and His Error, which won the Pulitzer Prize, and the National Critics Circle Award for Biography. He actually, his wife, Jane Taubman, is here today. Um, she is also a professor of Russian at, uh, at Amherst, and um, you together wrote, co-wrote Moscow Spring. He's written numerous books um, on uh, Russian political science, as it were. Um, he was the president of um, the American Association for the Advancement of Slavic Studies in 2009 and chairs the Academic Advisory Committee of the Cold War International History Project at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington. Also interestingly, he's received the Carol Kramer Medal of the Czech Republic and the Order of Friendship of the Russian Federation. From Medvedev, not Putin. Ah, <laughs> fascinating. I was going to say yes. Yeah, <clears throat> Dmitry Medvedev was the president at that point. If it had been Putin, no. I don't think I would no. have taken it. But we really have um, such an expert in our midst, so I'm really excited to try to understand what made Mikhail Gorbachev tick, a, uh, one of the most mysterious figures, really, in a way, of the 20th century, but one of the most important. And Professor Taubman actually spoke Quite, quite at length with Gorbachev, which really makes this a very unusual circumstance. Jane and I spoke, uh, interviewed Gorbachev eight times for about two hours each over a nine or 10 year period beginning in 2007 up through 2016. And he said to you when you questioned him, uh, Gorbachev is a very complicated man. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, in the a, third year, person. a year after I had first met him and was working on the book, we met him at a concert and he came up and said, how's it going? And I said, slowly, apologetically, and he said, Gorbachev trudno paniać, which means Gorbachev is hard to understand. And I knew the minute he said that, it was gonna be the first words of my introduction of the book. <laughs> and so it turned out to be. And you know, we think like, what makes someone speak about themselves in the third person and, and be hard to understand, and well, know that he is hard to understand. Well, you know, my first thought uh, was, he not only thinks he's hard to understand for the world, but he, he himself finds himself hard to understand. And after a few years, I began to think that was too much, that I was reading too much into it. But a few years after that, I came across a quote, which is also in the introduction by Alexander Yakovlev, who was his closest ally. And it's in the introduction, you'll see it. And he says, I think Gorbachev found himself hard to understand. Which, so I think that's true, and that makes it even more interesting. Which is actually very mature in a certain kind of way. As a psychoanalyst, I'll say, very mature to realize that you are very complicated and conflicted. And so, as all good psychoanalysts must, we must go back to the beginning and um, <laughs> take a look at his childhood, which is always very formative. Um, his parents, Sergei and Maria, he was yes. born, and that's what's so fascinating about this man, he was born a peasant boy. Um, 1931, which means that he grew up in terrible times, famine, collectivization, terror. Both of his grandparents were, grandfathers were arrested. His, uh, his village was occupied by the Nazis for four months in 1942. It's fascinating. So both of his grandfathers were arrested, yes. really for uh, by by the regime, but but for crimes they didn't commit. Essentially, one for not planting, even though he had no seeds to plant mm -hmm. um, because they were essentially starving, and one uh, for being a traitor of sorts when in fact he was anything but. Um, but what's interesting is that after years of, of of horrible treatment, they came back. They returned. So he had this idea as a boy, um, I, I, it, it sounds odd to say, but in a way this optimism, right, that, that even though they were taken away, they were returned. Well, there, these were among several miracles that occurred during his childhood. Another one was that his father was reported dead at the front. Uh, they got a letter from the authorities saying his father was dead. And then a couple of days later, they got a letter from his father's, and they, th they thought to themselves, was his father killed after he wrote this, mm -hmm. 
but it turned out his father was not killed and he came home in triumph. So there was that miracle. Um, another miracle was that as the peasants starved during collectivization, his grandfather happened to be the chairman of a collective farm and he protected his children and his grandson. So, so even though there were, there were two uncles and an aunt who died of starvation yes. during this period, he and his family survived. And he was left with, um, and I, I just think this, is, this seems important in terms of the person that he was and his viewpoints as he, as he later rose in the party and the kind of work and, and what he did with the country, that he um, had this um, idea of survival, of it's possible, work hard, and it's possible to survive. Not only survive, but work hard and miracles can happen. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. when the clouds are darkest, the sun will come out. And so he actually describes himself as having had a happy childhood in the midst of all this yes, famine. Yes, I, I, I had, it wasn't that hard to deduce it, but I had gotten that impression. And then again, several years into the research, I came across a sentence in which he said, we were, we were as poor as beggars, but I felt wonderful. <clears throat> and that confirmed this picture of a guy who grows up in terrible times, but emerges self-confident, with self-esteem, optimistic, and most interesting, trusting in people. To emerge trusting in people from the great terror period of the Soviet Union when families disappeared and friends denounced each other is another miracle, and it happened to him. And very unusual, and you know, um, oftentimes if we're talking about somebody, particularly in the series, who's had um, a very economically difficult upbringing, there's often a lot of trauma that actually sets them on a course of depression and so on. But in his case, um, they, he felt provided for, and probably very important was his relationship with his father, Sergei, who you describe as, and, and he describes as, a really warm man. Well, it actually begins with his, grand, his maternal grandfather and grandmother, and I think if we can move to the next picture, says he yes. ignorantly, <laughs> yes. not, not sure. Yes, oh, yes oh, there yes. it is. There, there's a picture of Gorbachev at, I guess, about four or five or six with his grandfather, the collective farm chairman, and his grandmother. And I love this picture because you can sort of see he's got his hand resting on his grandfather's thigh. His grandfather has his hand on his shoulder. His grandmother has her arm on his shoulder. You can see warmth and maybe even love in this picture. And this is the father's parents. This is the, the mother's, mother's parents. parents. Okay. And that's odd because the father, we could go to the next picture. Yes. There's the father, Sergei. Look at him. You can uh, uh, maybe I'm deluding myself, but it seems to me he's a sweet man. You can see it in his eyes, can't you? And it's not just Gorbachev who says that. Other people who were friends or acquaintances of his father and family talk about what a lovely man he was. So and, he got this love from his grandparents and his sweet father. So his paternal grandparents were not were not particularly warm. He no. stayed mostly when, when the parents, he wasn't with the parents, with the maternal grandparents, yes. who really adored him. Well, even, even the paternal grandfather, who was, whom he describes as rough and tough and authoritarian, had a soft spot in his heart for Misha, Mikhail. So I guess that meant something special, that even this rough, tough guy regarded little Mikhail as his favorite grandson. So there was something already in his temperament that, it, that was appealing, clearly. And he, had, he, was, he was beloved. His mother, though, Maria, you describe as uh, not so warm, cold and yes. difficult, demanding. I think if we go to the next picture, yes. we'll see her. There she is. Yes. With Gorbachev <laughs> a little older. Now, Gorbachev, we had these eight interviews. And in one interview when we were talking about his parents, Gorbachev suddenly says, when I was 12, my mother picked up a belt to beat me again. Well, first of all, I was shocked that he would say this. Uh, and then he, he described the scene. He said, I grabbed her arm and I pulled it down and I said, never again. And she wept, he said. <clears throat> so at least we had the wit to ask, why did she weep? And he said, because I was the last person she could control and now she could no longer control me. Well, I have to admit, especially to a psychiatrist, uh, that I leapt to prop too quickly to certain conclusions. Mm. Uh, I thought to myself, this could be the key to the whole story somehow, because how often 
does a mother beat a child? Whereupon my wife reminded me that in Russian household, peasant households, children were beaten all the time, mostly by fathers, but sometimes by mothers. Yeah. And it turned out that she protected him, defended him during the war when his father went off to war. She was the one who kept him alive. She went off for days trading the father's last suit of clothes mm. for grain, and she brought it back to feed him. Mm. So I conclude that it wasn't quite as decisive as I thought. But what I still think, and I'd love to get your reaction, is that from the grandparents who loved him, and especially from the father, he developed some of this confidence, some of this optimism, some of this sense of trust in the world, mm -hmm. people will be good. Mm -hmm. But from his, and, and maybe the sense that he deserved to be, in the end, a great man. But from his mother, I think maybe he developed a need to be the great man that he thought he deserved to be because he was looking for some affirmation and approbation to make up for the way she had treated him. Well, narcissism often is sort of a dirty word in our culture, right? But really, um, insecurity and need to be loved and need to be special, a certain degree of it is, can be quite healthy. A certain degree of self-love is really quite healthy. And, um, and to understand that your mother may be disciplining you to, um, because she loves you to some degree, but also um, obviously the trauma of that because it is and the need to be um, beloved by her could certainly spur one to, to need to be special and appreciated in a very driven way. And clearly, as you elucidate later, and we'll get to, that was very, very important to him. You use the word narcissism. And um, as far as I know, Gorbachev was never treated Right. Psychotherapy. Narcissists but, rarely are. <laughs> but, 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 but moreover, as I said, many leaders have this um, intense need for uh, being special and being awed. And it, it often makes them, in some ways, a good leader um, when it's not combined with um, sociopathy and lack of empathy for others. Well, there, a leading, perhaps the leading Soviet psychoanalyst wrote uh, a book about Soviet leaders. And he has a chapter about Gorbachev, and he describes him, his narcissistic features. Uh, and I shrank back because I'm an amateur. I'm not a professional like you. And I don't, didn't want to use the word and inviting all of the negative as connotations. But uh, Gorbachev's closest aide, whom Jane and I got to know very well, Anatoly Chernyayev, knew him better than anybody for years and years. I asked Chernyayev about it. He had read the same article, and he said, that's right. I recognize the characteristics that this psychoanalyst had mm -hmm. named. So I came to the conclusion, and again, I'd love to hear your attitude toward it, that Gorbachev, if he was a narcissist, it was at the healthy end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I read a piece by a professional like you who said that what that meant was egotism and self-confidence. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And he certainly had plenty of both. But, but, but not the need to be the center of everything. And he had a, a real empathy, as you describe him, a real um, appreciation for the suffering of others. And that became a big driver of his political policy later. But on the other hand, the self-confidence was, I think, a key both to his rise and eventually to his fall. Because the self-confidence gave him the feeling that he could not only become the Soviet leader, but he could change this country, mm -hmm. which for centuries had been authoritarian, a czarist autocracy, a communist dictatorship, that in a few short years he could turn it into a democracy. Yes. That took tremendous self-confidence. But then when things started going badly, I think it shook him more than it might have otherwise because mm -hmm. he didn't expect it. Mm -hmm. And as a result, he began to... Well, this gets into what we're so going to we'll, come to we'll, later. We'll go there. Yeah. But to add to his uh, development of self-confidence were two things. He, his father had him work the farm. Mm -hmm. He worked 20-hour days. Um, he worked big machinery. Um, some Today, a parent would say, Are you, I'm not letting my child on that machinery. That's crazy. Um, but he worked that machinery, and he gained a confidence that he could really um, do adult things, as it were, and really be instrumental in his family's life. Together, the, together they ran a combine, which is a huge machine, uh, and they engaged in a competition with others to see who could 
harvest the most grain, and he and his father won. And in return for this triumph, his father was awarded the highest medal that the Soviet Union could award, the Order of Lenin. But, and this is his father again, his father insisted that his son also be awarded a medal. And so they awarded Gorbachev the next highest medal, the Order of the Red Labor Banner. And he never took it off. He went to Moscow University and... But that helped him actually go to Moscow. It, having, it helped him get so, in. So now he is really what in some ways is most desirable. Um, he is, uh, he does incredibly well in high school, right? He is, uh, so he develops self-confidence there as an, as an academic of sorts. He loves to read. He's viewed as a good student. Um, He's he, chosen as the, as the leader of the Young Communist League. But there's one incident I want to ask you about. He describes the moment when several students are contending to be the leader of the Young Communist League in the high school. And he gets up to give his speech. And when he goes back, some other kid has pulled the chair out from under him. So when he sits down, he collapses on the floor. Now the question, I was asked this by Amherst students, what does that mean? Does that mean they kind of like him and think it would be kind of cute? Or does it mean they resent him? We don't I mean, know. <laughs> we don't know, but it sounds like a bullying. It sounds like a, an attempt at a humiliation and a bullying <laughs> okay, maneuver. Okay. Sometimes, I mean, chronic bullying, as we talk about today, you know, can really undermine self confidence completely and lead to a uh, poor future in terms of mental health. But occasionally, something happening in the backdrop of overall feeling confidence can actually build resilience. It can make one think, now, how do I, what happened here? Um, did I overstep? Did I misread the room? Did I do something such that um, I that I cannot do again? Can I build some resilience and have something happen and get back up? And you know, of course, we ultimately see him as really a master, masterful with people and masterful at negotiating very difficult systems. Um, but in high school, he started already with, you know, I running for offices and. Uh, Acquiring a girlfriend. I have, if we could go to the next picture, I think, oh, it's another one of his mother and he, now much older, and, their, and his little brother. But if we go on to the next one, I, it's high school. This is high school. And this is Gorbachev playing the leading role in a play. And the girl to his left, our, well, forget about left and right, in the white costume is his girlfriend. And we learn about a scene which tells you much about his self-confidence and, in fact, the degree to which it became arrogance. Because he finds her editing a wall newspaper in the school, and she hasn't done it right, and he bowls her out. And then he chastises her before the entire editorial board of the newspaper, and she is humiliated. But then when they leave the school, he asks her out on a date. And she says, how can you do this? You just chastised me, and now you're asking me out on a date? And he says something like, you can check it in the book, something like, my dear, these are two different realms. Again, good practice for the future. <laughs> um, he, uh, yeah, he really, he really demonstrates this growing confidence. Um, but it's not just with his mind and his abilities. It is with his interpersonal skills. Um, because, in fact, she goes out with him. She does. So there you go. But then he drops her and meets somebody we will soon see. So he uses his good grades and, and, and uh, how revered he is, essentially, in high school as a student, um, and his uh, identity as a peasant boy, essentially, to appeal to Moscow State University, to uh, this award that he mm -hmm. was given, um, and because Moscow State is a very prestigious university, he does decide he wants to go ahead and study. Yep. He um, uh, he's exactly what they're looking for, essentially, and he mm -hmm. frames himself that way. And he decides to study law, which, unlike today, is was not considered a terribly prestigious kind of major to have, but nonetheless, it's what he's interested in. And he meets, if you hit this, I think we, oh, this is not his wife. We're waiting for his <laughs> wife who comes up later. This is very important though. This is a Czech student then at Moscow University who becomes Gorbachev's best friend in college. His name is Zdenek Mlinash. And in 1968, during the Prague Spring, he is 
Alexander Dubček's right-hand man in charge of ideology. Now, in the 1950s, he was not yet the man he would become in 1968. But the impression that you get of him is he's an idealistic communist. He wants nothing to do with the horrors of Stalinism. And he and Gorbachev trade confidences about the reality as opposed to the propaganda. There's one occasion which I talk about in the book in which they're watching a movie together, which is, get this, a Stalinist musical comedy. <laughs> you know the word oxymoron? Yes. <laughs> yes. And in this movie, the happy farmers bring in the harvest, and the happy milkmaids go to the store and buy beautiful fabric to make dresses. And at this point, Gorbachev whispers to Mlinash, that's not true at all. The only reason they work is that there's brute, there's brute force, and there's nothing to buy in the store either. So these guys knew already a lot at that time. And yet he was able to maintain this sort of duplicitous outwardly as a, as a child and a teenager, he was pro-Stalin, as it were, right? Well, I don't think of it as duplicity because I think it sounds again as if by maybe the phrase is cognitive dissonance. He was able sincerely to believe Compartmentalize in, this. in mm -hmm. a lot of the propaganda mm -hmm. and yet be aware of a lot of the reality. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the fact that he believed what he believed in, uh, in the propaganda probably enabled him to voice it more convincingly without being thought to be devious in the mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. And so this was a, the, the, the time at Moscow State University was very formative for him. Um, he clearly enjoyed the learning. He was there also an excellent student, and it is where he met, as you said, his future yes, wife. Yes, I think she's our, oh, there she is. The one on the polka dot, is that polka dot sort of the dress? Raisa Titirenko was her name at the time. And it was love at first sight, at least on she, his part. She came from a similar background, also, mm -hmm a peasant background, yes. um, and um, also did without, um, as they were doing often and even in a way at the university. She had recently uh, been broken up with, Yes, was about to be, was essentially engaged, really, or thought she was mm -hmm. engaged, and, um, and he called it off with her, so she was really devastated, and it was at this setting that they met. So. As a result of having been ditched by her boyfriend, actually by her boyfriend's mother, who turned out to have said she's too lowly, lower class for you. Uh, she didn't want another connection, another relationship, but he persisted and eventually convinced her. Uh, she was a year younger than he, but a year ahead of him at the university. She was in many ways more sophisticated and better educated than he. And I later learned, well, I had, a lot of people had this impression, but I heard it firsthand from some of their friends and colleagues that she was stronger than he. Some of these colleagues and friends said he should have listened to her more, but others said he should have listened to her less. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to know the truth, but he loved her and we know, the, we know these days especially how many politicians are less than perfect husbands, shall we say. He was a nearly perfect husband. He loved her, he was faithful as far as we know. He was a devoted father to their daughter, the only child, and grandfather to their two granddaughters. Um, it was a perfect match in that sense, a rare thing when it comes to politics. So he grew up in a family where he had a model for a marriage that stayed together, um, or that seemingly yes. stayed together, for the importance of family and how valuable that was. He really, as you said, he not only loved her, but he admired her. He respected mm. her. Um, he was not. He was not looking for somebody um, who would uh, sort of take care of business while he went about his business. No. And they had this very intimate um, connection where they talked about everything. He that was very he, yes. important. Yes, Gorbachev also talks about how much his father loved his mother. He talks about how every time the father was away for a while, he would bring gifts. Uh, you got the sense that his mother may not have fully requited the love of his father. In fact, Gorbachev told us, didn't he, that uh, she had first refused to marry him. Yes. Uh, and then their second child, the little boy we saw in the previous picture, came along 16 years after Gorbachev. 
Of course, he was away, the father was away at the war for a while, but I think that's unusual, that's unusual. for a peasant family. Mm -hmm. um, if we go one more picture, I think we get to see Gorbachev in the university. Jane and I call this Gorbachev in his Paris actor phase. <laughs> <laughs> But he's very handsome, and she's very, she's, she's considered be very beautiful, um, very stylish. Yes. Everything she wore looked wonderful on her, and she cared to look wonderful. That was Im important to her. Um, and she uh, uh, she was unwell, though. She was sort of a sickly new bride, as it yes, were. Yes, she was. Unclear what was going on, some sort of I tried to find out. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. But they, they, uh, they wanted to have a child, and they were told not to. But they conceived a child. And Gorbachev actually says in his autobiography, which has not been translated into English yet, that she had an abortion. And it, she, it devastated her, he mm. said. Mm. And she was told then, never again. But they dared to try again about uh, four or five years later. And they produced a beautiful daughter. Irina. Yeah. And he was a very devoted father by all. Well, until, he, until his life was overwhelmed by all of his political obligations and his job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he still spent, he would come home at the end of the day and they would discuss everything. They would. Yeah, this, is, this is a really interesting thing. In Soviet times, well, husbands and wives did talk about things in the kitchen, not outside, sometimes with a pillow over the phone so they couldn't be overheard. Uh, but they not only talked about everything with each other, they talked about everything with their daughter, even when she was young. And this turned out, turns out to be a, a, a very important fact in itself. But later on, we haven't gotten to this yet, if, uh, later on I learned that Gorbachev thought that Yeltsin was superficial and a patsy whom he could easily dominate. Mm. And the reason I learned that, or the way I learned that was Somebody, Gorbachev told somebody we knew, or, or no, I'm sorry, their daughter <clears throat> told somebody we knew that the Gorbachev family never discussed Yeltsin at the dinner table, whereas they discussed everybody else. And she took that to mean Yeltsin wasn't worthy of discussion. Wow. And they were concerned about being spied upon at certain junctures. They would go outside and stroll yes. the grounds yeah. of, their, of where they were staying. They're never, you never speak of them as being particularly materialistic. Um, that was never important. So this, the ideal of communism, essentially. Well, they, she got herself some good clothes. Uh, <laughs> okay. it, the, so, the clothes were so beautiful that most people thought they came from abroad, but they insist that they didn't. In fact, they insist that a woman living in the same communal apartment uh, sewed them for her. Mm -hmm. And she made sure that he looked pretty good too. But they certainly didn't do things like collecting Mercedes, which Brezhnev did. And I mean, the corruption all around them was deep and dark. But they were not, they were incorruptible. And when this again gets a little bit ahead of our story, but when Jane and I were in Stavropol interviewing people who knew him as he climbed the ladder of the Communist Party, over and over again we were told that he, well, some people didn't like him, but over and over we were told he was wonderful. And the thing that they kept coming back to to prove how wonderful it was was how beautifully he treated his wife. Mm. And a lot of the others didn't. And you could sort of tell from meeting them. So as soon as essentially university was over, um, he did move immediately, fairly immediately, into a political life. Oh, this, well, OK, this, I'll tell you what this is, and then we can get to, to, to it. The, up on the rock, you see Gorbachev and Raisa. And OK, a, a pumpkin um, brownie, or whatever, <laughs> whatever it was I just ate, to whoever can identify <laughs> the man taking their picture. You're right. Somebody's read the book, no? <laughs> <laughs> That's Yuri Andropov, who at the time was the head of the Soviet secret police, the KGB. This is a man who put people in insane asylums to keep them quiet if they were dissidents. This was a very tough guy. Uh, but he took a liking to Gorbachev. And here's where luck enters into it, too. 
The only reason he got to know Gorbachev this well was that he vacationed in those mountains, which were nearby the place that Gorbachev was running as the party boss or the deputy party boss. Uh, now, why did Andropov take a liking to him? Uh, I think that the main reason that Gorbachev is that Gorbachev was such a good guy. You sometimes come across the phrase new Soviet man. Mm. This is what the communists hoped communism would produce, the ideal person who would be smart and sensitive and sophisticated and honest and efficient. And Gorbachev seemed to be all of these things. Mm -hmm. And so I think this tr attracted Andropov. I, th I don't know, remember whether we have a picture, we probably don't, of Kosygin. No, so. Let's see. Yeah. No? Yeah. No. Nope. Okay, you can go back if you would to Andropov. Uh, but he attracted the admiration of these leaders who promoted him, and eventually they or their successors made him the leader of the Soviet Union. So people describe that he was a good man and they liked him, but at the same time that he and his wife did not really befriend the couples. Um, whether, how much of it was that uh, the, the women weren't that crazy about her, um, how much of it was that they kept to themselves. They really, their family time was very important. They were not interested in spending it with a lot of other people, the little bit of time that they had. So they were not uh, very social. So in a way, friends didn't get to know them, as it were. So how much was it um, that people liked him, and how much was it that people didn't know him, or didn't know them, or didn't have a lot of exposure? So it was just these little snippets on which to Well, you know, it, I, I'd be interesting to say, to hear what you're gonna say about this, but I, I, it just occurs to me, there's a kind of pattern. They kept their own peers, you know, at their own level, at a distance, and didn't allow them into their life. But Gorbachev and Andropov spent a lot of time together in the mountains, hiking, cooking shashlik, mm. listening on a tape recorder to songs by semi-dissident bards, songwriters. So they made an exception in their privacy, insistence on privacy. They made an exception to play for the up. big boys to play who up. could promote them. I mean, so I don't want to over, uh, Gorbachev was a terribly decent man as political leaders go, but he was also calculating and manipulating, and this was some of the manipulation. So this was, um, so in some ways he knew that he needed to do these things to get where he wanted to get, and yes. he wanted to. He charmed the people above. Charmed and the people, and the people below, eh, mm -hmm. not so much. Um, and so his peers didn't, and, and he didn't leave his peers much to say about him, because frankly they just didn't know. Well, we met, it, it was a sort of bipolar situation in this town of Stavropol where he climbed the ladder. We met people who hated him then and hate him today. One guy in particular, I won't go into it, but a monster. <clears throat> but then we met people who adored him then and still still do. So he, he, I tried to figure out what would explain that. Jealousy? That different approach. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I still don't know, but I think it may have been that people who aspired to his position mm -hmm. and didn't get it, hated him. Sure. And people who settled for the position that they were in we're happy to enjoy his noblesse of liege. And he was, in fact, good to others, generally yes, speaking. Yes. He was not spiteful, um, and if he did not win the competition, he did not seem to take it out on others, mm -hmm. which, was, which was really rather unique. So, uh, yeah. talking about his rise to, to power. Well, this, as you'll recognize, is, or I hope you will, or many of you will, is Konstantin Chernyenko, the last Soviet leader before Gorbachev. He was the third of the three nearly dead men walking <laughs> whom Gorbachev succeeded. Brezhnev, who really was gone round the bend by 1978, but remained leader for four more years. Andropov, who by the time he became leader was quite sick and was tethered to a dialysis machine for much of his year in power. And Chernenko, who could barely walk and barely breathe. Uh, and the fact that these last leaders had been so feeble and terrible, made it almost inevitable, as it turned out, that Gorbachev, whose back is to us on the, this side, mm -hmm. would be chosen because he was young and vigorous and educated and smart. There was only one other member of the leadership who was his age, uh, Romanov, who was a drunkard, 
And although his name, Romanov, would have helped him before 1917, you remember the Romanovs? <laughs> yes. It didn't help him in 1985. Yes. So it was Gorbachev by acclamation. Acclamation also, the people at this, at the, or the people of the country were to some degree starting to f look for a new guard, as it were, right? They wanted the young, a younger person with some progressive ideas within the not, structure. Not just the people, the KGB, mm. the Central Committee, the military, they all were tired of having a, a, a doddering old codger at the top. They wanted vigor, they wanted youth, they wanted imagination, strength, and they thought they were getting it with Gorbachev. They got more of it than they had, anticipated. Had anticipated. So that appealed to them that he maintained this um, sort of some of the trappings, I guess you could say, of his peasant background, that he presented himself still always as a man of the people. I mean, that, that he was not uh, uh, a fancy or um, that he did not take advantage of the system in the way that some of the men who went well, before him Well, in the long did. run, when things started going badly, uh, the people turned against him. And one of the things they held against him at that point by 1989, 90, well, by 90 and 91, mm -hmm. was that he never stopped talking. They, you know, he talked too much. Machiavelli taught leaders, don't talk too much, and he did. But in the beginning, they loved him because he could, he could speak. In fact, there's a, there was a, there's a wonderful joke. Brezhnev, when he would speak, he would have a text in front of him, and the, the letters were big, and he would still stumble. Gorbachev would speak without a text, and the joke is that people looked at this and said, he's even worse than the previous leaders. He can't even read. <laughs> because <laughs> he doesn't have a text. But his focus on uh, agriculture, which yeah. he knew something about, and, um, and the economy, and feeding the people and so on, this also worked very much in his favor in terms of his moving up the ladder. Except that agriculture turns out to be the graveyard of aspiring Soviet leaders. Mm -hmm. There was no solution to it, so they put him in charge. And the real interesting thing is that even though there were no improvements to speak of, they promoted him again. And that was a sign that they, the people above him were not looking for a way to derail him, but they were going to excuse his failures such as they were because they thought he was still going to be a savior for them. Or how, how, was it that, or, or also sort of the, I mean, the, the old guard didn't want to be replaced. Um, so promoting somebody who looked too wonderful seemed Well, there were dangerous. elements of the old guard. There were some people in the, in the Politburo who aspired to be the leader themselves. One of them was Andrei Gromyko, the old foreign minister. Mm -hmm. Another one was the prime minister. Mm -hmm. But in the end, uh, they shut up and, and allowed him to proceed. He had allies and they pushed him ahead. Along the way, though, he had this wonderful relationship with his wife and they are very close and she advises him often in, in terms of what she thinks he ought to be doing. Um, but she had to give up going back to school and yes. studying and doing what she, she had wanted gotten to a, do. a higher degree in what amounted to sociology and she regarded herself deservedly so as a scholar she had taught after having difficulty finding a job in this provincial town but she decided to give up her career for her husband and once they got back to Moscow that was the end of it and I dare say when we you know, in the end, when we get to the end and talk about her death, we'll discover that maybe the life of First Lady was not what she was cut out for. She might have been better off and lived longer if she had kept to her career as a scholar and a teacher. So this was, this was very sad for her. This was a difficult decision, kind of a depressing decision, yes. that she was very stimulated by what she was studying and she wanted to accomplish in her own right. And so um, do we attribute this to her love for him? Did she, do you think that she aspired to uh, be first lady even though it didn't turn out the way that she wanted? Um, or do you think that he, because you, you say some things that make it seem as though at this point, he does become somewhat controlling. He does say like, look, this is the way it's gotta be. Yeah, he, he becomes less sympathetic than he had been before. I think it was out of her love for him. I mean, the pattern in their life from then on is that she devotes herself to him and his career. She travels everywhere with him, both in the Soviet Union and abroad. And a lot of people in the Soviet Union, including women, take this very badly. And they say to themselves, 
uh, who elected her. Mm -hmm. And he makes the mistake of saying, when asked by Tom Brokaw of NBC News in an interview, uh, what do you consult with her on? He says, everything. And this is taken very badly in the Soviet Union by a lot of people. But he comes with some unique, unique ideas, unique in terms of opening up to the world at large, trying to forge alliances as mm -hmm. had not been mm -hmm. done. Um, he is open in a way, and his policies are open in a way that is not seen well, before. Well, he changes Soviet thinking uh, entirely. Uh, and in fact, he sort of leaps from the old Soviet way of thinking, class warfare, East versus West, communism versus capitalism, never an eternal peace. He jumps over in the end, sort of realpolitik, great powers, and he envisages a new world of harmony and peace and non-use of force. And he thinks, we're looking at a picture here, he thinks he's found a partner. And in a way he has in the arch conservative American President Ronald Reagan because they both believe that nuclear weapons should be abolished. And they almost agree at Reykjavik. This is another miracle. It's, it's like his father coming home from the war. I mean, it, it's still, it, it, I puzzled over this for a long time and I won't try to explain it, but I think there was a kind of personal chemistry between them. They were two of a kind mm. in many ways, despite their ideological differences. And he had this personal optimism that we think Reagan was had it too. Was was right, and Reagan had it too. That was instilled from childhood that he believed he could accomplish these things that he did do. I have. I'm not going to read it, but I have a passage in the book in which Francis Fitzgerald describes the Reagan marriage, and if you get to read it, every time you come to Reagan, substitute Gorbachev, and instead of Nancy, say Raisa. And it's a perfect description mm. of the Gorbachev marriage. Uh, so I think they hit it off in a way that, uh, that produced political progress as well as personal friendship. It's also amazing that given his, as you said, um, I guess circumscribed um, uh, alignment with Stalinism early um, and his friendship with the head of the KGB, et cetera, that he maintained this, uh, the value in nonviolence. And that was a big part of the way that he, politi his political idea, uh, his, all of his ideas really followed from that to some degree. Well, there were people who were killed um, in, in Baku, Azerbaijan. They sent in troops after a pogrom of mm -hmm. Armenians. In Vilnius, people were killed when troops went in. It's still unclear whether Gorbachev knew that was going to happen. Mm. But basically, he was almost nonviolent. And for a Soviet leader, this is just impossible. And I tried to figure out where that came from. It's hard to say. In one of our conversations, I asked him whether a scene that he describes in his memoirs of coming across in the woods, the bodies of troops killed in the war, blood, you know, blood, skin, bones, a terrible scene. I said, is this where you came by your commitment to nonviolence? And he didn't answer. Mm. And I took that to mean that he was a little embarrassed that he should be associated with nonviolence because as mm. a political leader, you have to be willing to use violence or so goes the conventional wisdom. But nonetheless, compared to, of course, compared to Soviet leaders, but even non-communist leaders, yes. he Remarkable. shunned the use of force. And his exposure to, as you said, that these horrible sites of war, also though exposure to the grandfathers who told him specifically of the kinds of torture that they had endured in prisons for no reason, essentially, yes. may, had a big impact. His, the grandfather who'd been tortured but was released came home and for that one evening described to the family, including seven or eight year old Gorbachev, how he'd been tortured and then never spoke of it again. Uh, so Gorbachev, I think that made a deep impression on him and helps to explain his resistance to totalitarianism, mm -hmm. of which that torture was a prime example. And he, is it fair to say that he, his um, political maneuverings, the way up the party, um, to some degree may have given him the confidence to reach out to the Reagans and the, the 
the Thatchers and the, the other leaders of the world and believed that he could make these well, kinds of that, alliances? Plus, I think the fact that when he met and talked with Reagan and Bush and Thatcher and Cole and Mitterrand, he felt far more at home than he did when he met and talked with Honecker, the East German leader, or Zhivkov, the Bulgarian, or Ceausescu, the Romanian. He found them to be dead from the neck up and troglodytes. He wanted as little to do with them as possible. Whereas with these Western leaders, he felt at home. He had become a Western Westerner. By the time he was through in Moscow, he'd become a Western-style social democrat. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think he, if he, he never admitted that while he was in power, because that would have been a sin. But afterwards, he tried to form, and he did briefly form, a social democratic party. And so you think, in some ways, even earlier on, his aspirations were, to some degree, to democratize what was... Well, he, he start, this is another puzzle which I try to unravel in the book, and I'm not sure I have it right, but in 1988, he began to democratize the Soviet Union. He established the first mostly free elections, the, established the first genuine parliament that was not a rubber stamp. Uh, he turned glasnost, which means openness, into virtually free speech. Mm -hmm. um, and then, unfortunately, things began to go poorly. And at that point, uh, it became very hard for him personally. And I think because he had suspected so much of himself and his country, when things didn't go the way he had hoped, it shook him. And he begins to behave in a way that is erratic uh, and self-destructive. Mm. Can you give uh, us some examples of that self-destructiveness? Uh, well, before we do, let's yeah. look at yeah. <laughs> There's Raisa again, looking at him adoringly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, check the next one. I think it's probably Yeltsin. Oh, yeah. The next one is 1991, by which time the putsch, the coup in August 91, has failed. Gorbachev comes back to Moscow thinking that he's going to pick up the pieces and run the country again. But by this time, Yeltsin is the boss, and he is telling Gorbachev. He's humiliating him in just the way Gorbachev had once humiliated him. Mm. Uh, I get the sense of Gorbachev beginning to come apart from descriptions of him by his closest allies. There's one in the book in which they're listening to him, watching him give a speech, and they can't understand why he's so incoherent, why he's bouncing around in his, uh, why he's allowing people to criticize him and smash him mm -hmm. in the audience, com other communists. He's no longer the same person they knew. He and lacks that confidence that he As if he's be. lost it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And my, uh, again, I'd be curious about your reaction to this. My, my reading of this is that the, the difficulties that he encounters would have been hard for anybody, but were all the more shocking and shaking to him because he had been so full of confidence, you know, that suddenly this man for whom everything came easily and who was mm -hmm. so popular, mm -hmm. suddenly it's not working anymore and he doesn't know how to, to handle. He's thrown for a loop. So in a way, even though one can admire his, his, uh, his hard work on his path, his development of resilience due to failures and struggles and three steps back and then two steps forward is not really what happened. He didn't really develop the sense that I can be knocked down and, um, and still come back Well, he again. did stay. I mean, he stayed till the end. And, and he stayed with dignity. He didn't lash out. He didn't use force to try to But he to became hold. quite passive in that, in that time period. Mm. Sad? No? No, I'm not sure pa passive, but in, ineffective, at, ineffective at defending his own cause. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, he demonstrates a kind of resilience to stay to the very end with dignity. Mm. But he loses his touch. He, till then, he'd been a kind of master if not of strategy, then of tactics. Because the tactic, he took the Politburo, which by the end, in, by the end, in which by the end he was a, minor, a member of a two or three person minority out of 12, 15 people. Mm. And he got these guys to vote themselves out of office in effect. I mean, that was a tour de force. Yes. But um, he lost his ability to strategize and he no longer could sort of handle the big picture. He couldn't find 
answers to the big questions that remain. And so he, here he managed to be on the cusp of all these changes and, of course, arrive at this supreme position only to essentially watch the Soviet Union dissolve. Yes, he started out to save the Soviet Union, and instead he presided over its collapse. And if one begins to think of the word tragic, the next picture will depict the personal element of it. This is a picture of the two of them, Raisa and Gorbachev, about a year before she died of leukemia in 1999. And the extraordinary thing is that when she dies, he says, I am guilty. I am the one who did her in. And it can only mean that he felt, he realized in retrospect that she was temperamentally unsuited to the role that she had played magnific magnificently. Mm -hmm. This beautiful woman, stylish, mm -hmm. the first Soviet first lady, mm -hmm. after all the babushkas you know, of the past. <laughs> yes. uh, she charms the world, but it takes it out of her because she is more sensitive than he. She, he brushes off some, at least, of the attacks on him, and she takes them all to heart. Mm. And she gave up her own career yeah, and her process. own mind for him. Is that part of his Yes, his I think regret? so. He, mm -hmm. She apparently urged him long before the end to retire and often talked about how lovely it would be if they could live in a cottage by the sea. Mm. And he felt he had to go on because this was his project and he couldn't give it up until the end. And uh, then it was too late yeah. for them to. I think is the next picture the, the funeral? Yes. yes. Yeah. There's Gorbachev and there's Irina, the daughter. Yes. So this was really a, a tremendously devastating blow <clears throat> for him. His country gone. And country gone. The love of his life. The love of his, his life, life gone. gone. So we're going to talk about what, what happens to him after all of this is gone. Um, but first, I want to open it up and see if anybody has questions for Yes. Thank you, sir. He's not even a relative. Namely, can you tell us whether you think there was certain similarity between Khrushchev and Gorbachev that both challenged the system of Khrushchev in the 56, which was had a different vision, and both engaged with the West. Can everybody hear? Yeah. So, okay. You're good. Well, one of the reasons I decided to write about Gorbachev is that he, in effect, picks up where Khrushchev left off. Khrushchev begins the reforms and then retreats and is ousted. And then we get 20 years of keeping them at bay. And Gorbachev picks it up and goes much, much farther. One reason he goes much, much farther is that he's much more educated and cultured. Khrushchev has two years of elementary school education. Gorbachev graduates from Moscow Law School. Um, so I was interested in, in that, you know, what explains Gorbachev's ability to do that? Whoops. <laughs> um, on the other hand, I expected, and here I think I was wrong. I remember thinking to myself, Khrushchev is going to have been easier to write about because he wears his emotions on his sleeve. Mm. You know, it's like splat. Anything he's thinking is out there. <laughs> Uh, whereas Gorbachev is more constrained and contained. I remember thinking that, but then I realized as I worked on it that that was the challenge, to try to figure him out despite not having the clues that Khrushchev sort of splashes in your face. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was very glad to have done both. In fact, my problem at the moment is I don't know what to do next. <laughs> we'll take it, we'll have a vote afterwards for you. Yes. Yeah, louder, Gordy. I think. Sorry. He had a circle around him that shared the new thinking and worked with him. How did they find each other and trust each other? Uh, did you hear that? <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, the person who was close, the new thinking refers to uh, new thinking about foreign affairs. 
And the person who was closest to him was Shevardnadze, the um, foreign minister, former party boss or in, in Georgia, Soviet Georgia. And they found each other because Gorbachev picked him. They had been neighbors when Gorbachev was climbing the ladder in southern Russia. So Gorbachev knew he would be uh, a kindred spirit. Um, they found other people. I think one of the interesting secrets, it's not such a secret, in late Soviet times was that a lot of people in high places like the Central Committee and the Foreign Ministry led double lives. They were double thinkers. They had to say certain things because that was expected and they would be punished if they didn't. But on the other hand, in their hearts, they were already thinking the way Gorbachev was. And so he found these people, these people found him. There were a lot of them considering that you might not have thought there were any. But on the other hand, in the country as a whole and in the party as a whole, and especially in its very top uh, Central Committee and Politburo, there were very few. So many as they were, they were still a minority. And as the majority got angrier and angrier with Gorbachev for both his foreign policy and his domestic policies, uh, they and began damning him and moving against him. He didn't have enough allies in the end. You definitely do, <laughs> and I just. I describe it in some detail in the book. And uh, I was recently at a conference and somebody criticized me, said it was, you know, I shouldn't have done that in the book. It was too, I don't know, tabloid style. <laughs> but I thought of it as partly as comic relief. Um, <laughs> but also it was fascinating psychologically because remember I said a while ago that I thought the similarities between Reagan and Gorbachev helped to account for their personal chemistry. In the case of Nancy, and Raisa, the similarities seem to account for their enmity, their mutual enmity. And I tried to figure out how that could be, and I'd like to see what Gail thinks of this again, but it struck me that when the similarity, when what you share with somebody else are features that you feel are your strengths, yeah. that feels good. When you share with somebody else the features that bother you and, and, and make you feel unhappy about yourself, then to see it in this other person makes you annoyed with the other person. But when you've had to give up your own identity to essentially make the identity of your husband your own, your own um, then your husband's rival, essentially, in a way, is your rival. Um, and, um, and, and she had her own mixed feelings about having given up her identity, which, uh, as you're pointing out, she, she saw in Nancy Reagan. Yes. Um, her, her own uh, being Ronald's uh, backer, so to speak, but, but certainly, in a sense, right, they were, they were competitors, and to feel special, you wanted your husband, i.e. yourself, to be the most important, mm -hmm. to be the biggest in the world, um, especially if you've given up everything for him and you feel essentially that is now your identity. We, um, they in would one, be rivals. In one of our last interviews with Gorbachev, uh, I read to him a quote from Nancy's memoirs, which I think is called My Way or something like that. <laughs> my, my turn, my turn. Uh. And she says at one point that after this long rivalry, she said, I think I've come to the conclusion that the problem was we were both insecure, yes. Raisa and I. So I said to Gorbachev, how does that sound to you? And he said, right on. I think that was, that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Yes. I will reinforce the comments made previously. Your first book was great, and so far I have played two. This guy's almost related. He's related to, <laughs> <laughs> he's a best friend of my in-laws, <laughs> or my daughter's in-laws. <laughs> what about China? What about China? Yeah, Gorbachev loved the West, but what about the billion people south of China? Mm. Well, he does, one, one of his achievements is he actually warms up the relationship with China. He has a meeting with Deng Xiaoping in Beijing in 1988 in which uh, they, or 1989, in which they settle some of the issues. But it's also an interesting meeting because when you read it closely, you can see Deng Xiaoping is condescending to Gorbachev because he, Deng Xiaoping, 
has been around much longer and feels as if he knows more. And it turns out that the Chinese think Gorbachev is, and these are the words of Deng Xiaoping according to his son, an idiot for putting political reform first and delaying economic reform, which is the opposite of what the Chinese do. Mm -hmm. And Gorbachev sort of returns the insult by thinking Deng Xiaoping is an idiot because of Tiananmen Square, mm -hmm. which he would never do. But very quickly, the, the bigger question that a lot of people ask in retrospect is, why didn't Gorbachev take the Chinese path, which seems to have worked so well for China? And I think Gorbachev would say, if he were here and you asked him about it, he'd say something like, Russia is not China. You know, the Russian Revolution was in 1917. Several generations go by. By 1985, nobody remembers how to do it the old pre-communist way. China, the revolution's in 1949. Mm -hmm. the, re the reforms begin in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. People remember. Mm -hmm. there are, it's, it's more complicated than that, but it's a very interesting question. Well, in, a lot of, in retrospect, a lot of Russians say he didn't have to act. He didn't have to do it, and therefore, in doing it and leading to the collapse of the system, he is guilty. Uh, at the time, it didn't seem quite so rosy. We were there often in the years before 85 and 85, 86. The, there, there was very little food in the stores. There were long lines for everything. Uh, the place, the word the Russians use is stagnation. It, it wasn't going anywhere. It was led by these decrepit leaders. You know, it, it was involved in what appeared to be a new Cold War that had begun with the, K, the Korean airliner and that sort of thing. So it seemed to Gorbachev and many people that reforms were necessary. But of course, he took those reforms much farther than a lot of people wanted, and they produced the result we, are, we all know. So it's easy in retrospect to say, why did he do it? He shouldn't have done it. It wasn't that bad. It became worse. He made it worse. But you have to sort of imagine an alternative counterfactual historical scenario. Let's say no reforms or very modest reforms which don't change anything. Let's say the Soviet Union persists for another 15, 20 years. Then what? Then maybe it collapses. Maybe it collapses in the kind of civil war that occurred in Yugoslavia. You know, maybe there's blood all over the place instead of the few instances that occurred under Gorbachev. Uh, maybe the leaders in the Kremlin are executed like Ceausescu in Romania. So it's hard to say. I mean, uh, I, when Russians tell me, as they often do, that Gorbachev was a bastard and this was a terrible, a terrible thing he did to their country, I listen to them and I understand them and I even feel for them because a lot of them lived through miserable, chaotic years under Gorbachev at the end and under Yeltsin. But it's easy to say in retrospect that it shouldn't have been done and who knows what would have happened if it had not. So the sad, well, the sad thing is that um, he, had this, he had this secret meeting with Yeltsin to turn over power essentially. Yes. Um, it's purported that he was uh, sort of went from that meeting uh, tearful, um, sad that this was seemed truly over, that he had lost essentially and lost his wife and lost his money. He really was essentially had nothing. Well, they gave him a decent, a very good house to live in um, compared to most houses. Uh, and he quickly began to, lecture, began to lecture all over the world for six-figure fees. Uh, and he used that money to create a foundation. Mm -hmm. And with a little help from Ted Turner, who gave them a million dollars, they built a new building after Yeltsin kicked him out of the one that he initially gave them. Uh, and the foundation, he, I mean, in his post-power years, he reminds me a little bit of Clinton and Jimmy Carter. Mm. 
a foundation doing good work. It has a think tank. Uh, it has conferences. Uh, he had to provide the money for it. The state didn't give him any. But in the end, uh, as his health fails, he can't make, give these lectures. He can't make money. There is no money. And you can see the sort of collapse of his life in the reduced uh, space in his building, which is devoted to his foundation. Mm. In the beginning, they rented out some of the building to Moscow businesses as a way to try to earn money for the foundation. And now, as the years go by, there's less and less and less room for the foundation. Mm. And more and more is occupied by business. There used to be a library where I did a lot of work. Mm. That's gone. Gorbachev still has his office and a meeting room where we, where we had most of our meetings. But like so many other things, that has been a sad evolution. And he did some curious things along the way. He advertised for various companies. Louis Vuitton. Vuitton and Pizza, yes. Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut. That's he, a marvelous advertisement. If you haven't seen it, it's terrific. He won a Grammy for... Yeah, well, he... Uh, I think he, he, he certainly doesn't mind the glory but, and the, uh, the, the visibility, but he wanted the money for the foundation. So, so really, his dedication was to continue to do the good works. He tried to stay politically involved. Well, he, he, he ran for president in 1996, and he got less than 1% of the vote. And, and the, again, going back to Raisa, she had never really recovered from a stroke she had during the August 1991 putsch. Mm. But she insisted on accompanying him during his campaign mm. to 20 cities. And during this campaign, people spat in his face. Uh, halls that they thought they had rented were closed to them. And then the final insult was less than 1% of the vote. So one thing that's so tragic, in a way, about his life is he certainly conceives himself as a good man. Um, and uh, so many leaders in other countries might agree that he mm -hmm. was quite a good man. But his own people, in a way, um, he, I mean, he, he achieves his highest position through appointment as opposed to Yeltsin, who is yes. voted in. And so he's never voted in or um, approved of by the people. And, and to some degree, and he that's, could have that's lived a out, tragedy for him. He could have lived out his life in either Germany, which would have taken him immediately mm -hmm. for all the help he gave them in reunifying the country, mm -hmm. uh, or in the United States. Uh, he lived for a while in San Francisco, and we've discovered on a recent trip there that there are people who are still convinced that he lives in San Francisco. <laughs> we, we encountered somebody who pointed the Presidio. That's where he lives. <laughs> no, he doesn't live there. But he won't live in these countries. He wants to live at home. He wants to prove by staying in his country that he is faithful to his country, even though so many of his countrymen are no, not faithful to him. So being good, being loyal, um, uh, working on the behalf of the people, these were all, these remain and still remain important tenets for him. Yes, yes. And he still has hope. Uh, he doesn't like Putin. That's a, another big subject that we don't have to go into. He doesn't like him, and yet he likes him. Uh, why? <laughs> <laughs> he likes him because, first of all, Putin's predecessor for 10 years, Yeltsin, hated Gorbachev and gave him the back of his hand. Putin, when he came in, at least respected Gorbachev. He consulted with him. He invited him to the Kremlin. Mm. We went to Gorbachev's 71st birthday party in 19, what would it have been? 2006, right. And um, it was in a banquet hall on the edge of town. It was respectable, but it wasn't super. Two months before, Yeltsin had had his birthday, same year, 75th birthday party, in the Kremlin with Putin as the host. So Putin uh, pr obviously preferred Yeltsin, who appointed him president. Uh, but I think Gorbachev has learned that Russia cannot be quickly democratized. And he now will say things like, it may take decades. He's even said, it may take the whole 21st century. Now, if you believe that Russia has reverted to its sort of natural authoritarianism, then Putin's authoritarianism seems less outrageous mm. because it's part of the natural evolution of events. Um, and I think he, well, one other thing, he, his, 
criticisms, Gorbachev's criticisms of the United States track almost perfectly with Putin's. They both believe that the United States, through the Iraq war, NATO expansion, a whole series of things that have gone on, has, has driven, Yeltsin, uh, driven Russia into the position it has adopted. And Gorbachev, I think, believes that. On top of that, he believes that he personally was betrayed because Bush, George H.W. Bush, had promised him a new, that he would cooperate in a new world in which NATO would first be transformed and then might even you know, fade away. And James Baker, the Secretary of State, on February 10th, 1990, said to Gorbachev, NATO will not expand more than one inch to the east. And it hasn't expanded one inch. It's expanded hundreds or, th or thousands of miles to the former borders of the Baltics with, with Russia. So Gorbachev is bitter about some of the things that he used to, to accept. And he accepts that a certain amount of authorita authoritarianism is necessary. But it's interesting, in, in 2011 and 12, when there were the massive demonstrations against Putin's rigging of elections, Gorbachev suddenly woke up, and it was the old Gorbachev, and he said, democracy's coming again, <laughs> except it wasn't. And so he had to lapse back into his sense of fatalism. On that note, I think that's a good note to end. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.